คือไลน์ Welcome to BWI Talks Island SOS I'm William Campbell your host for today's presentation This eight part series focuses on sustainable ocean development initiatives in island nations around the globe Each presentation covers a different island and topic and will highlight the unique perspectives and involvement that islands have on ocean conservation and they will showcase the different practices that they've undertaken to safeguard their surrounding ocean too. BWI appreciates the generous support of Chubb Bermuda, the, ex the exclusive sponsor of this series. Island SOS aligns with Chubb's mission to promote a healthy and sustainable planet, to strengthen the resilience of communities, and to protect biodiversity against the effects of climate change. Today's Sustainable Ocean Strategy presentation, the sixth in our series, centers around the work being done in Trinidad and Tobago by the Environmental Research Institute Charlottesville of Tobago. Located in the traditional fish, fishing village of Charlottesville, Tobago, Eric works towards sustainability for the people and ecosystems of Northeast Tobago. Lania Fanovich is Eric's senior ecologist and outreach training expert, brief check national coordinator and eco driver trainer for Trinidad and Tobago. Please join me in welcoming Lania. Hello. Hello, Lania. How are you doing? I'm great. I was wondering just before your presentation, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, about how you got involved with uh, with reef, reef conservation uh, efforts and what motivates you in your work. Uh, well, um, I started working with Environmental Research Institute Charlottesville about eight years ago when they first started active operations. And I'm a marine biologist uh, by training based on my studies. So like any other young marine biologist, you know, I was excited for the opportunity to be able to rally, learn a bit more, uh, learn to dive and be able to uh, study the reef environment. And then gradually um, that sort of role expanded beyond just simple environmental um, and ecology type uh, research and started looking more in terms of sustainable development, which I enjoy. So it was an opportunity for me to apply my training from undergrad as well as master's level and uh, really Tune it into something applicable as well as being able to give back to the communities here. Thank you. Would you like to take it away, Alana? No, it's really, we've got a wonderful presentation for us to share. Okay, great. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, welcome to my talk. I'm going to be talking a bit about um eric's work with regards to balancing community and commercial interests particularly in northeast tobago so usually i like to start off by talking a bit more about what eric is about so all our projects every single program that we've implemented can actually fall into any one of these four themes that i have up here capacity building where we train community members to be able to participate in different research programs as well as uh, to be able to implement sustainable tourism type initiatives and to be able to contribute to policy development all our projects usually have that element of community involvement in them because in order for us to be able to make headways to be able to implement anything in Northeast Tobago, we need that strong community um, in, uh, involvement in our work. So by having these four themes in all of our uh, initiatives, it kind of lends itself to the vision that we've had for our organization, which is that we want to see sustainability in Northeast Tobago not just for the ecosystems but for the people so we want to see that synergy between uh, these two stakeholders if you will so the interesting thing about being a non-profit ngo here in a small island Melbourne state it seems a little bit odd that you know commercial we have commercial interests and it seems a little bit out of place when you think about us doing work in the sphere of conservation and community. But if it is that you have um, all these programs uh, placed against a landscape of blue-green, purple economy type projects, then you can actually have it work. So just so that you can get a quick refresh on what 
these different colorful types of economies entail. We have the blue economy, which tend to focus on sustainable use in your for your ocean resources. So we want to ensure that there's a balance and sustainable uh, in your ocean resources, as well as ensuring that there's no impact uh, to your ocean health. Uh, green economies, which usually is a bit more uh, all encompassing, you're looking at ensuring that there's that balance between your socio-cultural, socio-economic aspects with your ecosystems. So you're not implementing anything. You're ensuring human well-being and um, social equity without compromising your environment or ecosystems. And one other economy that's a little bit less known uh, to many persons um, is the purple economy, which tends to center around the creativity um, of people. So you're looking at things like your culture, looking at things like artistic abilities. Uh, so it's looking at how do you tap into the creativity of people and allow that to lend itself to generate an income. So with that in mind, we tend to try to develop our initiatives uh, to tap into commercial. Uh, how do we balance this now by considering what the commercial aspects of the projects entail, as well as the community aspects of the project. So one of the things that we that's normally considered when you think of commercial, are uh, how are these initiatives going to increase your economic activities within your communities? So, and the other thing that's of interest when you want to implement any sort of initiative to commercial basis is the mechanism for generating income and ensuring those mechanisms are again against a landscape of under that blue green purple so uh, sustainable economy uh, background the community now the community usually they're interested in how they can actually earn an income from any of the initiatives uh, they're also in, uh, interested in how they, how these initiatives ensure social cohesion. So there is no divisiveness among different entities within your communities to ensure that, uh, you know, everyone is happy, everyone is benefiting. Then you want to ensure that we're improving on the well-being of persons. And whatever initiative we undertake, there is a certain sense of cultural authenticity. So it's, it's not something that's out of place from the community. It fits in with the dynamics. It fits in with the cultures and the different livelihoods present within the communities. So we have to take these two different elements into consideration whenever we're developing our initiatives, uh, particularly in Northeast Tobago. And even more so importantly, as we are located in a UNESCO Man and Biosphere Reserve. So this is extremely important for us. So some of the initiatives that we have undertaken that kind of has that element of both commercial and community include things like uh, our conservation recreational diving, where we are looking into tapping into science tourism, having community members being involved and um, learning and teaching other persons about the environment uh, underwater, right? Uh, school expeditions, a lot of times we have different colleges and universities coming to uh, Charlottesville to learn different monitoring techniques. So it's integrated as part of their uh, field practicum for a particular course or uh, simply because they want to learn a bit more about small island development states, about rural livelihoods, etc. And this is, again, where they are able to inject money and income into the community because we are in a position to hire community members to be able to carry out some of these school groups and share information and really give them the experience that they're looking for, which is you know, and integrating them a bit more into the community. Uh, we have community-based eco-snorkel tours. Again, community members being trained to be able to carry persons out for tours um, while at the same time you know having different pit stops and teaching about the importance of uh, corals and the ecosystems 
uh, as well as it's not just all about you know showing pretty corals and fishes, but also demonstrating what are some of the impacts that are present within uh, the environment and how it is that it links to the communities that is in the background of their snorkel tour. Forest check tours, we have the tour guides from uh, who are well known and they know the Minoch Forest Reserve very well. So they can carry persons out and uh, it, it, there's an ordinary tour. You don't have to shift your tour to become, you know, and, and change it up, but they can carry persons out and give them have them integrated into something as conservation based, where they look for different indicators, look for certain observ um, observations, behaviors from certain organisms, and uh, you know check it off. And the, that data now can feed into uh, climate change monitoring. Uh, so that, that that's it. Um, our three most recent activities, which I will go into a little more detail. Uh, the Northeast Art Tobago Art Trail, where we have artisans, uh, artists from Northeast Tobago designing different murals, different sculptures, and installing it at strategic sites in Northeast Tobago so that it can give an additional element of, uh, you know, improving the aesthetics for different locations, as well as give tourists something to stop and take pictures with and interact. And um, at that way, and it also showcases the talent that is present in Northeast Tobago. And the next step in terms of doing something like this is really looking at how it's properly marketed into a proper tourism product so that you know, it's advertised and persons can you know get different things like tokens, you know, they go on this trail and try to find all the the, the sculptures or the artwork. So there is uh, an element in which the uh, artists, and this is where we have the example of the purple uh, e economy as a, um, you know, coming out of this. So the artists are able to benefit on top of, you know, producing this product out of their own labor of love. Uh, the yacht mooring buoys allows us to introduce moorings for yachts in Charlottesville. Charlottesville being an important um, town, uh, port of entry for yacht tourism, and uh, there is there historically in the past there has not been any sort of mooring buoys. There still isn't. There aren't any mooring buoys present within our reefs. And uh, what usually happens, they come, they toss the, um, their anchors over, and it can potentially damage the reef ecosystem present in Manoa Bay. Um, by installing these mooring buoys and partnering with uh, organizations, community organizations in Charlottesville, this is an element in which we can actually encourage the yachts to be able to not damage the reef, they tie up on these mooring buoys and they pay a fee, which is normally done in other Caribbean countries higher up. By paying that fee now, it allows them to access different services that they typ that was typically not offered before. And as a result, uh, it also increases employment opportunities. We're working with the Charlottesville Police Youth Club uh, on this particular project where they are being trained to offer different services, different cottage types of um, industry services, um, producing the different goods, um, also allowing different services like uh, taxis and um, uh, supplying water, hull cleaning, etc. So by training them to market themselves to be able to offer to these yacht tourists and you know that this is something that they can benefit from. Um, while they pay a fee now for mooring, this is how we, this is, I think, one of the biggest um, example of showing that link between commercial and community uh, interest coming together and benefiting. And at the same time, we're still conserving our environment. And then the oyster cultivation. So by working with a group of fishermen, selected fishermen, uh, we are able to demonstrate, we have the opportunity to test the feasibility of cultivating oysters in Charlottesville. 
So they are involved in every step of that particular project from the installation to the maintenance to the harvest and uh, the sales of these oysters. Uh, so it's a step away from the traditional fishing activities that they normally undertake. And the hope is that with this demonstration, we can expand on oyster cultivation and recruit more fishermen who can then now actually earn from practicing this. Some of these activities, the, in the intention is for us to be able to hand over over a period of time, uh, you know, the, the, the management of the different as um, these different projects. So Yacht Mooring Buoys, we hope that over a period of mentorship, a uh, th uh, three or four year mentorship, we are able to hand over fully to the Police Youth Club for complete management and maintenance of the mooring buoys. Similarly with the oyster cultivation, hopefully this is something that the fishermen can now take on completely on board as, as part of their livelihoods. So whenever we implement these uh, particular uh, initiatives, we have to always take certain things into consideration. We have to always ensure there are certain practices that we ourselves implement to ensure that we continue to have the buy-in of community members. So, for example, in no way at all do we expect volunteerism from our community members who are participating on initiatives. They're each paid a stipend for assisting and for you know, participating in the different practices, different projects that we have, activities that we have going on. So that is always a given. In the process of this, we ensure that there's always an element of capacity building. So for example, uh, with the snorkel tour, uh, we would have trained them up from learning about customer service. How do they present their work? What do they present to tourists? Um, or whoever their clients are, how it is that, um, and what it is that they're telling them. And we also add additional elements, for example, first aid training, so that they are suited for and, and prepared for doing anything um, that comes their way uh, and dealing with any situations. And then the final element is being able to market themselves, you know, having the posters out there um, advertising and putting them out there so that the people know who they can contact if it is that they're interested in a snorkel tour because the in intention is not really for us to benefit from these initiatives it's for the community to benefit from it we always try to outsource certain services um, so for example boat transport we don't own a boat but we can hire different boatmen um, and their boats uh, for, you know, things like our recreational dives, for installing the uh, oyster cages, etc. So we ensure that we, um, there are certain things that we can bring other community members into by simply paying for their actual services. And we also try to ensure that we have an equitable, as best as possible, based on the services that we're uh, we need that is equitable distribution of them across the community. So there's no one person who is monopolizing a particular service, unless, you know, and it's dependent on what it is. Um, in addition to that, usually whenever we uh, ask for prices, we do not charge a markup on top of this, uh, for especially if it is that we need to cater for certain clients, if we're bringing in certain clients. So an example would be um, if it is that we have uh, dive tour operations, the fee that is normally charged by the boat captain for his the use of his boat is kept as is. We do not usually put a markup on it because our intention is not to squeeze them to a very cheap price and then be able to put, we want to make services as affordable as possible and we want to make the experience as affordable as possible. So this is where uh, we ensure that the community is actually getting the value of their services. So the, there are many challenges that we would have encountered 
when we're dealing with these different, uh, when we want to balance commercial and community interest. And I can give you a litany of them, but I think the main thing that we've encountered so far is that entrepreneurship is quite stifled within the community. There isn't that sense of entrepreneurship or there isn't that sense of um, knowing how to channel those ideas and how to begin to develop those products. And some of the main things that would have lent to this stifling really would have been um, going back to the historical context where you would have had, um, you know, under that background of colonialism, that rich history of colonialism and slavery and indentureship, um, there has always been that history of suppression, suppression of ideas, suppression of uh, ambition, etc. So that has been handed down from generation to generation. And what you will find is that um, persons are not willing to really reach out. They don't know how to reach out um, and really develop their own business sense. Usually in rural areas, opportunities are quite limited. You have better opportunities in urban areas. Um, apart from, I mean, there's the accessibility to different services, there's accessibility to different resources. Usually it's uh, much easily accessed in urban areas. Uh, so for example, in Charlottesville, if it is that we need certain repair equipment uh, or materials to fix a boat engine, the closest place to actually access any of that would be in the southern end of the island, and that's at least an hour and a half um, access one way. Uh, so usually it is quite difficult sometimes to really establish themselves in um, rural areas without some sort of support. Uh, there's also a high dependency on government interventions. So there are different welfare programs that the government, uh, the Tobago House of Assembly will implement, for example, the unemployment relief program. Um, and this kind of has its ties back to that whole idea of um, suppression in, in, in historical times that ties to the colonialism. Uh, where prisons, you know, they're content to just simply work on uh, work for a few hours on government subventions, and uh, that's it. And it isn't that motivation to go beyond, uh, you, know, you know, that working for a few hours and, and you know, on government stuff. And then there's that accessibility to training and mentorship programs. Now, there might be a few training programs that are normally implemented, but what usually happens with a lot of these training programs is that it's a one-off occasion but there's a lack of mentorship which is what exactly is needed in order to groom um, the entrepreneur's um, spirit a lot of times there's a lot of um, emphasis on academia uh, in order persons are under the impression that in order to succeed you need to have um, a certain level of literacy and if it is that you don't have the literacy then you cannot really apply yourself and build a commercial enterprise. Um, uh, but unfortunately, there are quite a few persons who don't have that necessary, um, don't have that literacy level, but they do have the ideas, but they just need that grooming and they need that guidance. And without that mentorship, it's difficult for them to really implement it. So uh you know these are the, the basic challenges that have been really affecting the, that um, sense of entrepreneurship and this is these are things that we try our best to uh kind of move people away from by implementing these different activities under blue green purple economies so that you know they could really get out on their own and be able to apply themselves uh within the community um and I think that brings me to the end of my talk there. Thank you, Lanya. I'm sure all of us uh, in the audience learned a lot from that. <laughs> I'm sure we can all uh, do a little bit more to think about how we can better uh, orchestrate green, purple, and uh, blue initiatives in our own uh, economies. If you'd like, Lanya, I've got a couple of questions I'd like to ask you first before I turn it over to the audience as well. Um, sure. I'd first uh, mention, you'd mentioned that, uh, that Eric seeks to support uh, entrepreneurship 
uh, through giving uh, people that that work with you uh, stipends for development. Can I ask just how Erica funds its operations? So a lot of our work is project based and these projects are funded by different grantors. So we have different funders, uh, different, you know, from oil companies, international, local, um, even regional funders. Uh, so we present a project um, and in it, we always make sure that there is an aspect of um, stipends for that line budget there so that we can integrate the community members in it. So we always make sure that whenever we're submitting these proposals, we highlight the importance of community involvement and the fact that they are benefiting from this in some way. Wonderful. Can you tell us just a little bit more about the community around uh, Charlottesville and, uh, and what commercial activities have been uh, spurred by ARC's development projects thus far? So Charlottesville is actually a, a rural fishing community so the main source of income is, is really fishing that's the main livelihood then the second um income that normally benefits people would be tourism usually ecotourism type activities carrying out tours um you know boat tra shuttling services to access different places or or bus you know so those are the two main types of activities so we try to um you know work around those by allowing our dive operations to um create that sort of sort of income for boatmen uh we have the community-based field technicians who we've trained and they will normally participate in these sort of dive activities uh you know so it, it's it it varies um a lot of times uh apart from the the tours aspect uh we'd also try to assist persons in um developing their own well apart from us introducing the tours we develop help persons develop their own tours so there was one individual who did um a sort of a garden project where she had community members, children from the community assisting on the garden and tourists can actually go to that garden and also, you know, uh, you know, plant, help plant. And it's in a way supports children because uh, the money will go towards them, you know, being able to buy books or continue doing the work on the gardens, for example. So those are some examples that we've tried to work with. And um, just Basing off of uh, Charlotte's involvement uh, with, with fishing as well and tourism, do you find any other challenges balancing the, uh, the local uh, fishing industry or the commercial activities of boats with conservation efforts in the area? So the main issue we had really was with the yachts. Um, uh, the yachts just simply, um, you know, taking up space sometimes with the, within the, uh, you know, for the jetty space, jetty access for fishing communities. However, I think the main issue that a lot of the fishermen have encountered would have been from uh, other communities or other um, countries sometimes coming into the waters and fishing within the, and competing for that resource that they are also looking for. So, and that has been one of the main challenges that fishermen have complained about, just that they have to compete with other communities coming in and accessing the sites that they typically traditionally have accessed. And then you do have the outside ones, uh, commercial um, long liners, for example, fishing on the periphery or uh, vessels coming in from Barbados or Venezuela, even Guyana into our waters and also taking that same fish. So I think those are the two main things that really affect the fishermen. Are there, are there uh, issues with the way that uh, fishing grounds in the local areas are managed that are uh, that impact the social cohesion uh, within the fishing communities? Unfortunately, there really isn't too much management of the fishing grounds here. So it's something that is being worked on. And that is where the UNESCO Man and Biosphere Reserve comes in. We're working on the management plan so that there can be that, you know, designation of zones and, you know, you know, more or less managing with the fishermen with community, how these different areas are used and at what times they use. This is still a work in progress. Um, and as well as the fact that 
we are right now. Um, the fisheries, if you want to say it's managed under our very outdated laws. Um, the fisheries legislation is about since 1916, and we have been seeing drives, pushes to update that legislation to actually reflect what's happening in present times. But that has, you know, that's a very, very slow progress. So at the moment, it's really dependent on the fishermen to practice for themselves how they're actually, how much they're extracting, where they're extracting from. And, uh, you know, it's more or less self-management, self-regulation at the moment until the management plan comes on stream. Um, and sorry, just one more before I pass it on to the audience. Um, seeing that Eric does so much work in, in spearheading uh, initiatives around the area, uh, is there space, do you think, for Eric to get involved in, uh, in the conservation and management of fish fishing areas as well? Um, right now, we're working on the policy aspect of it. But as much as possible, we want to actually move towards having the management be from a bottom-up approach, which is at the community level. The community, the fishermen are the ones who really um, know what is happening and the ones who can be engaged for the management. What our The way that we might engage in this would probably be via supporting these fishermen um, and supporting like training, the capacity building aspect of it. But for us to actually go out and do the actual management, um, that won't really be in our portfolio. We'd really want it to be more the community, be community driven as much as possible. Absolutely, we certainly can get behind that too. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna pass over to the audience and just uh, see if we have anybody out here who would like to ask anything. All right. Hi, thanks. That was a fantastic presentation. I just wanted to ask, can you tell us about how SOS started, who initiated it, and uh, so how is it run? Is there a committee or a number of people that are on a board to decide what programs uh, get chosen to get worked on and all that? SOS? Um, I think this is more for BUEI to answer. Oh, Eric. I'm sorry, Eric. My, my, my pad came in lately. Eric. Erica, your, your company, uh, sorry. Okay, so Eric actually started um, back before 2014. It really was um, a few experts who had, you know, years of experience working within the communities um, uh, based on sustain, you know, looking at sustainable development, uh, tourism and uh, conservation within Northeast Tobago. So it was a, really a cohort of um, like three or four individuals who are now our directors, actually. And uh, we officially became active in operation back in 2014. So it started off as a two-man operation, more or less, CEO and myself. And then slowly, we've been able to incorporate a few other individuals, uh, put somebody to manage our dive operations, and then our community-based field technicians, accountants, etc. cetera. And, um, it was the, the opportunity for activity started when the government actually hired the FAO to run a project called the Improving Forest Protected Areas Management Project, where the aim was to establish six protected areas in Trinidad and Tobago, two of which would have been in Northeast Tobago, Main Ridge Forest Reserve, and there was a proposal for a marine protected area. So with that project coming on stream, it's um you know gave rise to an opportunity for eric to really come into the community and establish itself in order to prepare persons uh for when the marine protected areas uh, came into play when the major forest reserve protected area also came into play so that because one of the uh things that their few said indicated in their um assessment for such a project was that there was a need for bottom-up management of these areas in order for protected areas to work. Um, so that the government agencies needed to work closely with communities in order to uh, rally, you know, get that protected area system management working. 
Um, so for us, we saw ourselves in a role where we can train community members in uh, research act, uh, monitoring and research uh, techniques, um, training them to you know upgrade their information in terms of marine and terrestrial ecology, uh, and to really you know drive their own representative community-based organizations to participate in active management. So that was you know that opportunity really is what started us off, and then from there we've grown from one project to the next. Uh, over the years. Hi. Um, in your time in Northeast Tobago, have you noticed any negative changes in the marine environment through uh, either personal, um, like what you've seen hands on, or your research? Um, no, I have not seen. Um, I mean, there are activities that are impacting the marine environment, for example, um, spearfishing, which is unregulated at the moment, um, in terms of there isn't any um, restrictions for quotas or what species are targeted by spearfishers. So they have been extracting um, like key species, such as parrotfishers, from our reefs. Um, other than that, there may have been some land development occurring, um, which was a little bit strange, and we would have noticed uh, like a lot of sedimentation in certain areas uh, into the, the reefs. Apart from that, uh, we have seen an increase in um, very dark waters over the last couple of years um, coming from the Orinoco plume. So it's very enriched water, very warm waters uh, that usually uh, is present from July, August through to October. Um, so we, 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 and we're noticing that it might be having an impact on some of the coral species, you know, especially those in the shallower reef areas. So those are the main things that I have actually observed from my time here. Otherwise, um, we have lionfish. Um, it is not as prevalent as in some of the other Caribbean countries, but they are present. And uh, we've heard of complaints from dive to operators who have been noticing certain areas being decimated uh, in terms of its fish community populations uh, by these lionfishes. Thank you. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for your presentation. It's most interesting, most illuminating. I was intrigued with the notion of um, cultivating oysters. I would never have thought oysters would have been a, a, a species that you would find so far south in the Caribbean. Um, are there other bivalves that would also um, benefit from this, uh, this process, um, uh, scallops and the like? So um, I should clarify a little bit about the oysters cultivation. So we do have mangrove oysters present in Trinidad and Tobago, that is native to Trinidad and Tobago. Um, the oysters that we are cultivating right now, um, or will be cultivating actually, uh, they are not native, but they are triploid oysters, so they're sterile. They're not going to be able to breed in um, our waters. So the system that's been set up, really, it's um, these cage systems which houses the oysters, and um, they're harvested, but reseeded with young oyster spats, which are imported. So the idea is that the fishermen can now um, sell a premium type product to nearby restaurants, as well as into Trinidad, and who knows, maybe Barbados might be a, a potential target. Uh, so that really is what we meant by the oyster cultivation systems. Um, if there's other room for other products like scallops, uh, we're not sure yet. At the moment, we're just trialing with this particular species. And then as we grow, there might be um, a room for other species. One species that we will probably definitely try to experiment with will be uh, seaweed, um, simply because seaweed is traditionally grown and as well as drunk. It's consumed in uh, Trinidad and Tobago. 
and there is that market for uh, growing seaweed here. Fascinating. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Lania. And also, just, just so I can ask before we go as well, um, can I ask what the general population of the Charlottesville area is and, uh, and what, uh, what size of groups uh, each of these initiatives are targeting? So Charlottesville is relatively small. I think it might be less than 6,000 people present in Charlottesville. Um, the group, the different projects will target different age groups. Um, majority of them, like the yacht, Tourism, for example, we're working with Charlottesville Police Youth Club. So we're looking at children um, from as young as 17 years old through to adulthood uh, 30s for the Charlottesville Police, uh, for the Yacht Mooring Buoy projects. Um, the eco tourism, the, the eco snorkel tours, uh, they can be as young as 18 through to uh, 40 something, you know, so it's as long as they have that spirit um, and they're fit and able to participate. So those, the demographics we're targeting is really eight through to retirement, <laughs> if, if you will. Um, uh, that being said, the population for Charlottesville, um, I think it's it's quite, uh, it's somewhere in the middle. So that's where the majority of the population is in terms of the demographics um so definitely they are the ones that we are targeting do you see uh, do you see the frameworks that you've established with eric as being uh, transmissible to other communities around trinidad and tobago in the same format as long as the initiatives again are against that landscape where you're taking in consideration the community needs um then yes definitely it can be implemented in other places so for example the yacht mooring buoys uh, that we are implementing here in charlottesville can easily be placed in castara as well where they also have they're also a port of entry for a lot of yachts and um, again they don't have proper mooring systems but implementing and then engaging with a community group to manage that that is definitely possible uh, so it, it depends on the needs of the community. So there's, a, there's an, um, you need to have a needs assessment um, done and listen to them and definitely uh, maybe at least, you know, that, that thought process and as you said, a framework uh, could definitely be reflected in those different areas. Certainly, do really, really love the uh, the community first uh, uh, organization that you've uh, that you've put together. Are there any final other messages that you would like to uh, to give to other island communities as well in uh, in spearheading and leading their own initiatives for their own development? Um, really, it's just a matter of getting out to the communities, getting out to you know talk to different organizations that are quite active within the community that you're targeting. Listen to them hear what they are trying to tell you they will probably come up with a very long christmas list uh wish list but uh you can easily you know filter out and see what is possible to be implemented and uh you know and also look at what's realistic you know so as much as we'd like to you know give the community as much as they'd like we have to be realistic on what is possible when and if it is really that it's something that's really needed within the community and see what's the best and always start small don't try to recruit too many community members it's best always to start with a small cohort and then as other persons start to see the success story coming out of your initiatives they will want to get on board so you know Start small, be realistic, and just listen. Absolutely. Thank you for uh, certainly inspiring some hope and pragmatism among us today. Yeah. I'd like to thank you, Lania, for sharing how Barbados has deployed uh, sustainable ocean strategies around beach management. And it's our hope as well that your presentation will inspire and encourage other discussions throughout Bermuda and other island nations as well. Thank you for having me, and I'm, I'm glad to, um, if anyone is interested in talking a bit more, um, they're free to contact me and, you know, 
We're happy to talk more. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you also to Chubb Bermuda, the sponsor of BWI Talks Island SOS series. And please join us next month on August 27th at 4 p.m. when the focus shifts to the Bahamas with Kazarina McKinney Lambert, the Executive Director of the Bahamas Reef Environment Education Foundation. I'm William Campbell, and I'll see you next time.